Um, hi everyone again. My name is uh, Clara Sánchez Rebato Valiente. I am um, a, a PhD student and also researcher. I'm in the last bit of my PhD. So my uh, intention today is try to go through some of the issues related to mental health that are more common in, in academia. Because of my background as um, as an actual uh, PhD student, my uh, presentation is going to be focused on uh, the PhD process. But what I'm going to say here is actually uh, can be actually used by everyone who is actually not only in academia at different stages, not only PhD, it can be master students or or undergraduate students, but also by people who due to their work need to have like a really important mental um, kind of workload. So this is going to be very general at the uh, at the um, intention that is this also goes to the general public. So what we are going to do today is, uh, if I do it correctly, go through uh, a few of the issues that I have encountered. And because I have found, found it very challenging, I want you to be able to not go through the same uh, experiences as I did, or if you go through, you have resources to try and uh, find it easier for for you to um, overcome that that um, kind of uh, situations. So, um, as I said um, before, um, I am going to mainly um, um, pinpoint the issues that I had and I found that during the research for this presentation uh, are very common in, in academia and the PhD specifically, but it can be used by everyone indeed. So I think someone else is trying to get in. Just let me make sure I actually give them access. Mm, yeah. So the uh, what we are going to be discussing at the beginning is actually um, let me just okay. What we are going to be discussing now is the content. I already explained that we are going to be discussing uh, the um, um, the issues that. Uh, are more common in academia, but how are we going to be developing this? What we are going to do is actually um, by the uh, uh, other courses that have taken, my, my aim is to explain this from, um, I think the correct term is positive psychology that actually um, thinks or, or states that uh, during the uh, process of, of recovering, the person has uh, virtues and, and strength that can be used during the psychological recovery. But first of all, I want to admit and say that I'm not a psychologist. So this is from my point of view and from my experience, what I have gathered. And because of this, I advise you mainly that if after my session, after you have tried everything we're going to discuss, if you still feel like you need help, that your psycho well, that your mental health is not improving, please, please look for uh, kind of uh, appropriate help, appropriate assistance from professionals. Um, having said that, which is a very important point, um, what we are going to do now is a start by stating what is mental health and what is mental illness as a starting point. As you can say, he, see here, mental health and mental illness are two different states. Mental health is a state of well-being in which every individual realizes their own potential 
and actually can cope with normal stress or live um, or, you know, of living and also um, can work product with productivity and, and fruitfully and also so to, is able to make a contribution to their community. On the other end, having uh, a mental illness is a range of, of mental health disorders that can affect mood, thinking and behavior. Before we continue on, I want to make sure that you all understand that all these uh, terms are regarding uh, how you feel them. You can actually feel them through, through, hold on, sorry, through physical signs and mental uh, signals. So, for example, some some of the uh, um, um, things that I have encountered are eye twitching, nausea, brain fog. The brain fog is the state in which your your brain cannot actually uh, allow you to to think. Um, also, um, in in the mental signals, we are uh, exploring anxiety, anger, not feeling joy. Just let me. Sorry about that. I think that there's an issue and I want to resolve it first. OK, is everyone here? Yes. Sorry about that. I just heard something and I wasn't sure about what it was. Um, let me just double check that everything is ready. Uh, yeah, good. Sorry about the break. Uh, something in, in my computer sounded and I wanted to be sure that it was not related to the presentation. Well, Clara, can I say something? There are yeah. people who want to join and oh. I let them in. I'm able to let them in. So okay. I think you all are. So you can keep on speaking without, you know, being. Okay, brilliant. Someone, please make sure that every, everyone is uh, yeah. entering, please. And I'll keep on with the, with the presentation, of course. if that's all right. If at some point someone has any question, please make sure to click the uh, hand bottom and I'll make sure that we go through all the elements that may can be they can be uh, difficult to to understand okay please I, I don't want anyone to be left behind um, again okay let's go back to the presentation great as I was saying we have physical signals and mental signals so there's a, a, a whole different plethora of signals that can actually be part of your um, kind of um, signals that, that tell you that something something is not going as they should. Mainly what helped me to understand that I was not OK is that I was not feeling like myself for a very long time period that I was it's OK during, for example, in the PhD, it's a very long process, so it's normal that we have ups and downs, that you are more motivated at the beginning and then you have your own kind of doubts when you have all those step backs and you have to change things according to your plan. But the um, kind of breaking point for me was to feeling that the bad days were more, more common in, in my daily life routine than the normal date. Um, so when I felt that I was anger all the time, anger at myself for not being able to do my job, that I wasn't being productive as I thought I I could be, that I was feeling anxious all the time, that I couldn't sleep, uh, that's when I, I actually sit down with myself and said, okay, there's something that I am not quite sure what it is, but there's something bothering me and I cannot continue on. So if you feel like you are not being um, like yourself, please uh, look for any kind of um, support, mental support at your university or, or elsewhere, but mainly, or I would start by contacting your university uh, psychological support. So 
now that we know some of the signals, uh, I'm going to be uh, trying to go through um, a few of the topics that I experienced that I think uh, I can help you a little bit with. Anxiety. Um, sometimes uh, when we feel anxiety, this, there's this common perception of being kind of shaking and crying and not being able to breathe. And that's that's very, very extreme cases of anxiety in which anxiety develops to be a panic attack. And some the majority of the time, at least in my perspective, and all those PhD students and, and kind of students of different um, areas and and different levels that I have encountered. Anxiety is mostly this kind of pressure in the chest, this kind of uh, idea that something something is wrong, that you are alert, that you are discomforted. Uh, and this uh, normally, uh, or at least to me, this normally happened at night because at night, um, in my experience, because I didn't have all of these kind of to-do lists to follow, or these activities to follow, my brain was like blank. And that's when all my doubts, all my issues and all this pressure came, came in. So what I'm going to try to do is give you a few tricks to um, kind of, if not overcome, overcoming anxiety completely. I want you to be able to navigate through it and try to ease this discomfort because the majority of the times with anxiety came recurrent thoughts this idea of you are you are doing an activity okay you are, you are reading a paper or you're writing something else and you have this kind of recurrent thought in your head like i should be doing this i cannot forget to do x y z or or i did this i did this presentation and i didn't do it as i wanted um these kind of recurrent thoughts especially at night can make uh, very difficult to sleep but also during the day if you need to follow or you need to do certain tasks they can be very um kind of um they can they are very it's very common that they don't allow you to to actually do your your work in the way you want mm, okay i'm just is everyone seeing the presentation all right it's because i think i have the issue or or i think my my screen froze and i want to be sure that you are actually following me it looks good okay thank you somehow it froze and i want to be sure that you are there okay as I said, I'm going to give you a few a few tricks that allow you to actually um, control those thoughts and that anxiety. Um, um, first of all, if you're feeling discomfort, if you're feeling scared or you're feeling somehow weird, it may sound really strange, but you you need to stop and say. OK, I'm feeling, for example, uh, I'm going to give you examples for myself. I was very nervous before this presentation of actually doing it right, of actually um, being having issues throughout the, the presentation. So I said, OK, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to keep it simple, not only my speech, but my presentation. And if something goes wrong, I'm going to ask for help. And when uh before uh, a little bit before when Soban said okay don't worry continue the presentation I'll I'll make sure everyone is here or I'll make sure to allow them to to enter if if I can that's when my anxiety low down as you see even if I have done several presentations throughout the the my my uh, studies there are certain elements of uh anxiety that actually are very triggering to me, this idea of the computer shutting down or something like that. So what I said to me before this was, okay, you're scared of everything going wrong, of 
the computer like uh, switch it off in the middle of the presentation. If something wrong happens, look for what you know. Try to to ask for help if needed. Look for the uh, the program that you know and and the tools that you know. So that's my first trick. If um, feeling the emotions don't um, kind of calm you down for for a bit. Another uh, thing that helped me was the idea of you are, you are having these thoughts. So why don't you try and speak to yourself as you would speak to, to a friend? Imagine that a friend of yours calls you and tells you, OK, I'm having this important issue and I cannot actually calm myself down. So what would you do? You would actually tell her like, OK, let's sit down. What's wrong? How are you feeling? Why are you feeling this way? Talk to yourself kindly. That's very, very important. And it's a very um, small thing to do. I know it can be kind of um, a silly thing to say, but your brain is, is the best at, at creating the worst case scenarios. So you try to be more calm and more kinder to yourself. You can actually kind of um, distract the, the brain for those kind of catastrophe scenario that that your your head normally com comes up with that are not real, are the effect of your fear. So talking to yourself in a kinder way is a, a trick that normally it helps and it makes the anxiety, if not reducing to, to a stop, at least it allows you to breathe for a bit and to make sure what, which is your ne next step. Again, one thing that helped me regarding to anxiety and recurring thoughts was writing them down in a, in a sense that when you write them down, they get out of your head. You have them in a, in a piece of paper like, like this, and you can actually see and read read it all up and uh, kind of um, accept if the fear or the issue or the recurrent thought that, that you're having is actually as um, harmful and as worrying as they seemed in your head. And it's also a way of put it, put it into paper, put it somewhere else, that it at least reduces your kind of stress about it. If this doesn't help, I would suggest changing from from one room to the other. Like, OK, I have I have written down all my uh, kind of uh, recurrent thoughts about this presentation. I have I have double check. I have make sure that I'm talking to myself well, that I'm not hurting myself through through my through my thoughts. I'm making sure that everything is all right, but I cannot shake the feeling that something something is going to be wrong. Something's going to be prevent me preventing me from chatting with you today. What is the next step? Go to another room, go leave leave the things, and chat with someone else, with with your partner, with with your friend, with your family, if you live with your family, in the sense that maybe chatting with someone else about it, but sometimes it doesn't have to be about the topic. If you if you feel OK with chatting about what worries you with that person, it's it's a very calming uh, strategy to take. But sometimes you just want someone else to tell you about her or his day in a sense that your brain can actually um, kind of diverse from the main current thoughts and uh, find another kind of strategy to to reduce that anxiety. Um, part of this strategy is also connecting to someone else in the sense that if you feel OK sharing your your worries about it, if it's something related to work, for example, they can actually give you a second opinion or or present you to a tool you didn't know you you needed for whatever you are doing, and it can actually uh, allow you to um, 
skip or to reduce that kind of e uh, issue that you felt that you had. So, um, in that sense, uh, talking with someone can actually help. Um, if this doesn't help and you feel you are stuck and you're feeling anxiety, sometimes it's best to stop doing what you're doing. I know that most of you will have to do uh, papers and, and prepare for exams and do kind of uh, dissertations and so on. But sometimes if the anxiety and the recurrent thoughts are very, very loud inside your head, inside your body, sometimes it's best to stop what you're doing, sit down and do a different activity, some activity that gives you joy, that gives you this sense of calming that you need. Um, for example, in my case, I love reading and although there has been times throughout the PhD that I actually couldn't um, do the um, proper um, reading because I had to read for, for work, uh, reading is a very calming activity to me. So from the times I had a very, very extreme anxiety uh, issues, I use reading and reading out loud as a way of calming myself, as a way of focusing my head into something else. Um, for example, if you need to move, if you, your knee, you feel like you need to move, dancing or going for a walk, even if it's just like doing doing runs for whatever reason, gives you this, this way of releasing that anxiety throughout movement, which is always good to, to do as well. It's a very quick and a very organic way of, of um, kind of pushing the, that uh, thoughts outside and re releasing the anxiety out of your head. Um, if that's not very um, helpful, a very simple thing that I found that it's very calming throughout several articles that I read is a step into the sunlight. In my room at the moment, we don't have very direct sun, but if you have somewhere that you can actually be sitting down and, and enjoying the sun, the sun has very calming effects that we will be discussing uh, when we talk about uh, the the importance of sleep, but the sun also allows you to lift your mood for a bit, so that anxiety, if not reduced completely, is actually um, put in in a level where you can actually handle the 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 important issue that you have to tackle and that your anxiety is not allowing you to, to do so. So apart from that, if even we have gone through all these tricks and even though you did them, you did everything I said, you call a friend, you went on a walk, you decided that you needed to do painting or whatever reason or whatever activity that allows you to be um, um, enjoying yourself and um, getting to that calm state that we're looking for. Even if with that you are not able to uh, reduce those thoughts in your head, reduce that anxiety, one trick that helps me and helps my very loaded brain is to say, okay, we have, we have this issue. We have to solve this issue that is that is maybe something that you need to correct, something that you need to send, that you are very scared of, of, of sending for whatever reason. We need to do that. We know that. We need to fix this, this topic that is currently up here. But we cannot do it right now. You, what you normally or what I do is to pick a timing to be uh, thinking about that. Say, okay, right now I have to attend to this lecture. I cannot be thinking about X, Y, Z. Let's leave it to a couple of hours later when I'm having a break and we will try to solve this. We will try to solve whatever is causing you this, this anxiety. This idea of 
this idea of actually sitting down and, and placing a timing for that activity in particular has helped my brain more, more times that I can actually think of. But I'm going to give you a couple of exercises. Uh, one of them is right there, which is the five things, but uh, somehow it landed down. I'm going to give you a couple of exercises that have helped me with anxiety and recurrent thoughts. The first one is the thought parade. OK, you have this kind of um, convoluted uh, or, or mess of thoughts that it's hurting or, or not allowing you to to do your work. Let's let's try and visualize them. Imagine that this the separate. So you see, for example, I need to finish this reading and I don't understand it. And I know where to find the resources to understand it. OK, L let's let's find let's picture it walking by from one side to your head to the other. The idea is to place it in your head and also when when is there learn to let it go it's going to come back later because this is this this is not a final exercise we know that it's going to come back later but you are saying you are staying to that thought okay i'm i'm seeing it with i'm seeing it i'm with you i know the, i know that this is important and that it's very uh, triggering to me but i'm allowing you to let go um, I know you are there. I know I have to do it, but I'm allowing you to, to go away. The important thing about this, this trick is to two things. As I said before, you are feeling your and you're physically imagining your your recurrent thought. But also it's a trick to your mind, because when I normally do this exercise at the beginning, my uh, mind goes blank. I don't see anything in my mind. I don't see these thoughts that I'm thinking of. It takes a little bit to conjure this, this imagining in your head. That is a trick to show you that your mind, that you normally feel like is filled with all these worries and thoughts, is actually tricking you into thinking that because it can also be a, an empty space, a, a complete blank space there. So the idea of, of this uh, exercise is actually slowing down that train of thought. And when it happens, when you see that thought that is bothering you there, you are not only being aware that is there, but you are allowed and able to, when you think about it and you start like unraveling, uh, you are unraveling yourself in that, just saying, OK, OK, I, I see it, I know, but we are going to let it go. We are going to change into something else. I'll go back later to, to that. One issue or one other exercise is the five things uh, exercise. And this is more related to anxiety than to recurrent thoughts. When I had very high peaks of anxiety, I felt like I was not um, in a great place, that I was not able to focus on my work, that I was not able to help anybody else. And sorry. And what I did was through this exercise, you have to sit down and pick five things that you like, five things that make you smile today or make you happy today, five things that you have accomplished today. And in this case, it can be anything. It can be, OK, I got up today. I make breakfast and I eat the breakfast. So it can be five things. First, five things that you like, five things that you are proud of yourself, and five things that you have done today. This list, this is a small list, can actually give your brain facts because you know that there are facts, you know that there are things uh, that you have done, things that you are proud of and things you like that you can actually enjoy or that you have actually accomplished or that you are, um, there are five, five things that are very important to you. I don't know, for example, when I first did this, this uh, exercise, 
I came up with five qualities of myself that I really like. And when I had this kind of anxiety uh, episodes in which I thought I was not fit for my work, I came back to, to that list and it's like, no, 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 no. I know I can because I put it here that I'm hardworking, that I'm a good friend, that I am happy and I'm able to listen. So you have this list of um, facts about you that you know you can accomplish and that's something very useful so at least for myself now when we discuss about self-care which is the next point of my presentation um there are a few things that we need to discuss about first in order to understand self-care is the the um First is the definition of self-care and why it's important. And I'm going to, well, you will see my papers here because I have all the uh, topics that we are going to discuss today noted down just in case I forgot something else. But uh, starting with self-care is, self-care is the ability of individuals, families and communities to promote health, prevent diseases and maintain health and cope with illness and disability with or without the support of a health worker. And on the other side, we have burnout, which is a symptom, uh, sorry, a syndrome conceptualized as a result in from chronic workplace stress and has not been that has not been successfully managed. So in one end, we have all these activities that we can actually do or the or community can do to, to allow and to maintain good mental health. And on the other end, we have this, these um, symptoms that are the result of not being able to um, stop working in a very, very stressful um Ambience. And the importance of these two um, um, definitions is that when we start talking about self care, it's very, uh, it's it's a very kind of popular topic today. And burnout is the result of not being able to take care of oneself properly. Is the, the result of what happens if we don't do. Uh, a proper examination of our self-care. So, um, in our case, what we are, well, what I'm going to be focusing is the importance of self-care in the PhD program, but it can be also applied to, as I said before, all the activities uh, related to a lot of mental work. So it can be also applied to other studies, uh, or other works that um, need this kind of mental capacity and, and mental um, um, workload resolve very um, or resolve quickly. Um, mental self-care and, and is related to mental health in the sense that whatever your project is, without a proper self-care, you don't you will not be able to do what you need to do your project in my case the phd we have to take into account that all works or all the work that actually uh, needs a lot of mental a lot of alone time a lot of reflection and a lot of um, mental capacity are very, very draining in the sense that you normally see when you are doing a physical exercise when your body is tired, when your body is, um, you feel it. But the, the the head space, the mental space, is not as easy as to say, okay, I have done four hours of studying. Uh, I I my my brain has this kind of alert of saying like, okay, it's time to to stop until tomorrow. It's very easy to trick yourself into 
feeling that you can do more. The problem with that is that if you don't take care of yourself, um, the, the final work does not, does not, uh, will not be able to be produced. So what I have um, come up with is this um, a few, few tricks to, well, first, I come up with the the kind of um, this idea of how to implement a technique to to actually do a proper self care. Take into account that first of all you deserve to rest, but with all these activities that we have to be doing, in in all these kind of different um, scenarios in which we are working in in this case, the, the PhD, it's very easy to say, no, I can I can rest in another day. No, it's very important to actually uh, focus on self-care as well as well as the working working load. Um, one thing that can be very uh, useful is to say, OK, I'm going to do self-care and how how what do I do? Self-care is normally associated with activities that allow you to rest, allow you to mentally go to that place of resting, being at peace, being calm, and not being able to, or not, not, not being able to think about work. You can think about work, but it's this kind of idea like, okay, I'm in my time off, feeling that your brain is relaxed and you are enjoying yourself a bit more. But sometimes it's very hard to find that, uh, not, not that activity itself, but to find that routine into in which you can actually get into. What I would do is think about, for example, which objectives do you want to be pursuing with this self-care? I don't know, it can be, I want to move my body a bit more. So we will look into sports of some kind. I want to be more creative. Maybe that's, that's what you need. You need more creativity in your life. You can actually start to draw or read more or write creatively, creativity or with creativity more. Or maybe you just want to hang out with your friends and your family. So you can actually think about activities that you can do with them during this self-care time. Once you have done that, once you have thought about what objectives you, you want to do, another another technique you can you can think of, sorry, I almost forgot about this. If you cannot think about activities that you want to do, objectives that you want to get, kind of to accomplish in a way, but take into account that self-care is not about accomplishing, it's about feeling better. So the, the word accomplishing is not the proper word. I'm sorry. Um, if, you don't, if you cannot come with ideas to actually do a proper self-care, think about when was the last time I was happy? I was aware I was happy. What I was doing? Maybe I was walking and maybe I was, I don't know, um, I was chatting with my best friend and we were having uh, a meal or something. Think about those moments and think how to create or how to replicate that happy feeling in into the self-care routine. How to do a self-care routine? In my opinion, I would start by focusing in one activity and then um, trying to um, set a timing for that activity, a timing that you would respect. So you know that for, I'm going to give my example again. Um, at some point in my studies, I decided that I wanted to move more, that I needed to do some kind of activity to, to be away from home, away from the work, away from kind of this room, which is where, where I normally work, but I wanted to move my body. I didn't want to be in, 
in a social environment. I wanted mm. something else. So I started um I started doing dance lesson uh, through YouTube. So this is another thing. Normally when we discuss about self-care, th there's this common idea of, oh, I'm going to sign up to this class and is, this is going to be costly because sometimes a few uh, activities can be quite pricey in a way. So you can also find activities that are um, cheap or free or, there are different tools that you can actually um, look for that are not, not very expensive. So I started dan dance lessons through the pandemic. Um, and that was not not much. It was 20 minutes I could actually take out of my um, working load to change for a bit, to to rest my head and to to start, let's say, the time off of my day. It was the start of my time off. Then I could do something else. I could, you know, relax in the shower or, or wherever, but it was like my end of the day activity. Then I, I felt like I, I needed more, more movement in my life after the pandemic. I discovered dancing with the pandemic because we couldn't go out. I I couldn't go to a dance studio or whatever. So I decided to sit down and say, okay, I want to practice a sport. And this is uh, practicing a sport again uh, is, is not, when you decide you want to practice a sport, for example, you don't need to be an expert on the, on the uh, matter that you are going to be doing this is also applied to any other type of self-care if you want to nourish a, a kind of ability you you can start from 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 the very beginning it's okay so i decided to i wanted to to improve my swimming skills and for this what i did because i know myself was to, to go with someone else to uh, um, have someone to accompany me to this activity because I wanted to be held accountable. I wanted to be able to say, this is an activity I'm going to be maintaining. This is something my body needs and this is something I, I cannot skip. So having someone to go with is not only more fun because you go with someone else and you can comment it later on, but also is someone who will make sure that you can actually and that you follow what you said you were going to do. Um, so again, uh, you can do it on your own or you can do it with someone else and it can actually be a way of being uh, more, kind of protect that time a little bit more. Okay, but what happens if you are doing the PhD, like in my case, and you then have a lot of uh, things to to um, deliver and you don't have free time or you are in a master and you you have to do your dissertation and you need more time to do your studies the thing with these kind of uh, academic aspects of our life is that sometimes there there are going to be highs moments of highs in which you will be able to you will not be able to do everything you want but uh, keep in mind that everything you you do in regarding of self-care can change can be rearranged maybe you don't for example i decided that i um i didn't or i didn't have time for dance lessons anymore so I decided to slowly, or not as not as slowly, but I decided to reduce that timing. Like, okay, I'm not able to do three classes, but I'm going to maintain two or one. Or knowing that you always can come back to that activity when the timing is right. Other other um, other um, resources that I did was like, okay, I want to do. And my dancing lesson, but I don't have time to be in front of the TV mimicking what the teacher did on the YouTube. What I did was like, okay, I need to cook. I need to do the normal cooking. I'm going to practice my steps or my, my routine of dancing while I'm doing something else. So you don't lose it, but you combine it with something else 
that you compulsory need to do. There's different ways of rearranging what you're going to do. The most important thing is that whatever you pick, um, you protect it because it's your timing and your, your uh, free time to decompress from the anxiety and the stress of the academia. Having said that, um, it can be that some of the activities you do are actually um, very um, helpful at some point that you maintain it through time and at some point you feel like your brain is not is not enjoying that activity anymore that is more of a chore than actually uh, an activity you want to do do not worry this happened to me as well if an activity becomes more of an obligation than a self-care, a, a place where you can decompress and enjoy yourself and, and, and rest and go back to the things that bring you joy, it's okay to quit it. it. It was very helpful at some point. It's not helpful anymore. It doesn't bring you that, that joy. It doesn't give you that space of happiness that you needed. It's okay to let it go. Don't worry. That's something we have done and and it's OK to to change it if you need it. OK. Um, one thing that um, regarding mental health, I have found that it's very useful or at least it's very useful to me was um, regarding work was um, having your your PhD, I'm focusing here on the PhD, but it can be any other project that you are working on, uh, focusing on working and time management throughout this, this activity. Um, in the PhD, it's, more, it's very common to have this kind of yearly planning or, or completely PhD planning that you have to do for your studies that you set down or you write down everything you need to accomplish and everything you want to do throughout this timing that your university has actually gave you has given you to do your study and having that general planning is very important actually i would suggest to have that general planning somewhere you can actually see like what is your PhD about? What are the things you are going to cover? What are the methodology you are going to use? Which are the results you you are getting when when you are getting more into the the end of the process? When when you have the results, it's okay to write them down. Keep in mind that this planning can change, and it's more it's very common that it will change because you will find different things, different resources. And, and different materials that will kind of rearrange your topic. Um, the importance of planning the PhD and having it visible is because when you make it visible, you put it on your wall or in your kind of board, you will see the main objectives that your uh, university um, needs you to have. When I'm talking about objectives here, I'm talking about um, I'm, I'm a Spanish. I am from the, uh, or I study in the uh, Complutense University. So apart from my PhD research, I, I needed to do kind of um, formal activities that were compulsory and other set of activities that were kind of optional, but you needed to do a minimum of them. Those were my, apart from the, the research, those were my objectives bring that down, have it somewhere visible, so you can actually click, kind of check them out of your list once you've done, once you have done it, let's say. Okay, this is important because it will allow you to have having very visible what you, what you want to do, how you wanted to do it, and the things you will have to do it compulsory, in a sense that when you start doubting, you, you can actually grab that paper and say, 
I, I don't remember if I did this seminar or if I did this activity that I was told, because you check that out, you can actually see, OK, I did it. I have it here. And if you have kind of a certificate of some kind, you will also have this kind of backup um, resource that tell you like this is done. You don't have to worry about this. Um, having said that, when it comes to work, I would suggest to do a strategy. In this strategy, it's very important to have uh, an agenda or a kind of diary of some kind in which you write down not the general activities that you have to do or the general plan of, of your main uh, work. It can be your dissertation or your planning or your PhD. I'm talking about daily kind of daily things that you have to do. And I normally use a color code for red are the compulsory things for, for me. For example, I have this uh, workshop in red and I have to prepare all the materials also uh, written in red. But also you can go to the things that if I don't do it today, it's OK. It's, I want to do it. There's something that is high on my list, but it's not compulsory to do it for me. So that, that's for me, that's blue. So you, you will kind of organize your um, kind of daily task into, into your head. You will say to your brain, you have to focus on um, printing the materials for the presentation and make sure you are on time, make sure you know, think how things work. X, Y, Z, for example, in my case. Um, another um, another things that help me is to, um, having said all the activities that I have planned for today, uh, which activities, thinking about the compulsory uh, things on my list, but also there's a, a, a completely different set of activities that maybe I can delegate to someone else, if I'm working on a team, because I know that at some point uh, in the day, I may not be able to do them. I, I know someone else in my team that I can actually trust to do this. Or if I cannot, if I am not working on a team, for example, um, you can prioritize the compulsory activities and leave these secondary activities to timings in which you feel your concentration is not as high as in the compulsory activities. For example, if I need to prepare or summarize a, a document that I need to, to do for a seminar or, or to do for a presentation, that's a very kind of manual thing to do. I normally summarize my, my work by hand because it allows me to think and to process what I want to, how I want to summarize it and what I feel is important. So when my brain is not very alert, very active, that's something that I always put at the end of the list. I relegate to these low time periods because it's something that allows me to think but gives me it's more mechanic thing to do. I don't have to think a lot about or be very active on on the on the um, task. This is a way of pr prioritizing my work. This is a way of I have a lot of things to do today. Let's let's move around and and also let's think about how is more effective for me to do all the things I want to, to do. The thing with these strategies that I'm mentioning is that you have to keep in mind that the day has 24 hours, that you need to prepare meals, eat the meals, and probably you will need resting times, as, as we discussed in the, in the self-care. Um, sorry. Let me just double check because, okay. OK, as I was saying, um, keep in mind that all the prioritizing techniques that I'm giving you, you cannot do 20 things in one day. 
um, but only will cause you more anxiety, more uh, stress, and it will leave you down. It is best to think about the free, free kind of how your timetable is for the day. For example, I know that I have this meeting with you all, but I, I know that I cannot do several papers to this morning because we are chatting here today. So if I know that, I'm not going to be uh, setting writing an article for this afternoon because I'm not going to be able to do it. So it's important to when you are prioritizing that you actually sit down and say, how many tasks can I do today with the timing that I have? Because I have meetings, I have other things to do kind of already on the on the uh, diary that I cannot miss. It's best to write down four things and keep those four things that you think that you can actually do, uh, that you can actually imagine a set timing for those like, I don't know, uh, reading an article, an hour. So you know that I have a free hour to, to, to do that, that is part of my working hours. I can spend an hour on that. I cannot prepare another dissert and no a dissertation, another seminar for tomorrow after today a meeting because I'm going to be very tired after this event. So you need to plan knowing your capabilities, not only because of the things that you want to do and the time, the real time that you have, but also the energy and the mental state in which if you overload yourself, and it's very common to overload yourself, will be if you don't read all those 20 things that you originally planned. In order to be able to organize your, your activities, you have to keep in mind that there's, there is always going to be work to do. But you, you are going to be doing stuff. You're not being lazy. You just need to take one day at a time certain activities at a day and make sure that you actually follow um, the the plan that you realistically stated to yourself. Um, the, the important thing about this as well that I didn't wrote there when I said prioritizing, sometimes um, Sometimes you will find that the the activities that, that you planned, some of them can be tricky and it will take longer and you get you may get confused, you may get stuck. It's okay. It's okay to say I had to read whatever uh, six articles, but I only read two because the second one was tricky, was I was not prepared for that and I couldn't actually um do it properly. It's okay. You always have to take into account that these times, these these tasks can change. These tasks can be daunting. It is best to recognize when your head is not in the right place. Stop. Again, going back to doing something else that allows you to 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 breathe, to to decompress your head. And if you are still in your working time, go back to it. If even so, even then you don't feel okay with it, leave it to the next day. Give it 24 hours. Rest. Do other other things on your diary or do your self-care routine. Rest. Leave it 24 hours. Go back to that activity that was kind of complicated the day before when you are more rested. And even if at that time you don't know how to tackle that, how to do that activity, go and look for help. It can be uh, your peers, it can be your supervisor, it can be uh, um, online resources. You don't need to do everything you set your your um, in your time in your agenda to do in your diary to do. And it's important that you recognize when an activity is tricky to, to not 
punish yourself for not being able to accomplish. You didn't accomplish it today. That doesn't mean that you are not going to accomplish it tomorrow. Again, the importance of resting, going back to the self-care um, um, bit that we just discussed, you have 24 hours in a day and you're not going to be working the 24 hours. You need to rest. You need to set timetables uh, for yourself in a similar way you did when you were in high school, in, in a school, in the sense that you need to stop your work uh, and, and rest. I know that all the things that I'm saying can, can change because uh, the the um, academia is very uh, kind of demanding at time and you have to do a lot of stuff, but it's important that you rest, that you set a timing for uh, every day of, okay, it's 6 p.m., it's 5 p.m., it's 4 p.m. I did a lot in the morning, I'm very tired. Uh, whatever is not done by now, it will be done by tomorrow. Um, you need to give your brain rest in order to continue on. Now, I have written the social media. Why I come here to time management and, and task management talking about social media. During my uh, formative years, all my formative years, I have um, jumped from one social media to, to the other and I found them very engaging. And with that, it's tricky. That is tricky because um, sometimes social media can be kind of a, um, a rabbit hole we, we go into and we spend two hours of time and our timetable of activities just doesn't work anymore. And we punish ourselves because we enter to Twitter, we enter to TikTok, and we did we watch videos and we distract ourselves. My um my advice with social media is to well, I'm going to give you a couple of advices. And one of them comes with apps that are free that I will uh, mention now. First of all, if you need that you have, if you have work, I don't know, for four hours, you have uh, taken your meal and you have encountered yourself in, so in the social media, whatever social media you prefer, Maybe it's your brain telling you, okay, I need I need a distraction. I cannot go back to work straight ahead. I need I need I need to to rest. And maybe social media is your getaway to rest. It's okay. Um, I would suggest to set a small amount of time to actually get lost in social media and use alarms to actually uh, stop that timing. Why I'm saying this? For me, for example, it's very common to, uh, after I have my lunch, I go to social media to see what my friends and colleagues have commented throughout the morning. And I say, okay, I have one hour free to, to see how everyone is doing and see what, what's new on, on Twitter. I already have, I already said I'm going to, I said one hour, but normally are like 15 minutes. It's like, okay, my brain asked me for this as a getaway. I'm going to give it to my brain, but only 15 minutes. When those 15 minutes um, passes, we, we stop, we put away the phone and, and we do something else. If like me today, you are working with a computer, it's very easy to say, oh, I'm going to check the email and you end up on YouTube. What I normally do is to use uh, one app that is called, um, uh, sorry, uh, I, for, I just got blank. Let me just rethink. Um, no, not yet. The, the, the activity is called 
uh, sorry, the app is called self, self, uh, no, um, self block, if I'm not wrong. Um, and what you normally do with that activity, with that app, is actually to write down all the um, social media websites that you normally go to as a distraction and you state or you tell the app and you sit down and you tell the app, OK. This, uh, these um, websites, I don't want to visit them in two hours. So what? Um, sorry, no, I, I remember the name. It's called Block Me. Sorry about that. The, the app is called Block Me. It's kind of a black icon, sort of like, like a pirate kind of banner, sort of. But so when you go to block me and tell the app, OK, this is the app, for example, I don't want to visit Twitter in two hours, one hour. And you set the timing and it doesn't matter what you do. All the times that you go to Twitter is going to say that the uh, browser of your choosing doesn't find it, is not able to access. So in that, you know that for that timing and you cannot change it after you said you wanted a proper time, you cannot um, access there anymore. The other app I'm going to be talking with you about, there are several apps about time management and control, but in, in my case, I'm going to talk about Focus Me, which is also free. And Focus Me is a, a, a app that allows you to do this kind of uh, planning of the time that we just mentioned, but having kind of a set of alarms. This, uh, this app follows this Pomodoro technique in which you said, for example, I'm going to work two hours non-stop, and then uh, you can actually write the activity there on the app and set the timing. And then, for example, you say, OK, after this activity, I want a, a short break of 15 minutes. So the, the app will tell you when the two hours have a stop and it will indicate you in a different color that you are now on your resting time on your break. And then again, go to a different kind of a two hours long uh, activity session, actually uh, be able to work and then another break. So it's a, it's a way of your computer kind of checking with you that you actually work actively and rest okay. Okay, you manage to do that. The last thing I want to talk before going into the sleep hygiene, which is the next slide, is the imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome is this um, syndrome that it's called, well, this uh, men, kind of mental idea of oneself that you are going to be caught out for whatever activity or a study that you are doing in academia that they are, someone is going to tell you no you you fake it you fake it all along you didn't do what you said you did um the thing is imposter syndrome happens or at least i have found that happens when you are into more stressful kind of parts of your studies in my case the phd um, when I was writing everything down, even though I revised it and my supervisors, both of them revised it, I, I had the feeling of someone else is going to come to my door and tell me like, you didn't write this down, you invented it. You don't, you don't have a kind of supportive um, um, resources for this. Um, you have to take into account when we discuss imposter syndrome, first of all, you are prepared, you are already doing your study, you are, you are already part of the academia or forming yourself or working very hard on this aspect you wanted to, to work with. 
on on your your um normal kind of um labor day that you do but you have to keep in mind that not you're not going to know about everything and it's okay um it's okay to for example know a lot about a topic but focus your energy on certain aspects and commenting only others what focus for what makes me feel better about imposter syndrome is that when i finish my work when i finish my phd my work can be lacking in some areas and that's okay because i'm going to be allowing other researchers to expand the knowledge on my topic in areas i was very scared about or that i didn't have time to expand my my knowledge in so whenever you have imposter syndrome think about the work that you are doing because you are also you are already part of you are already starting something and developing something so you are not you're not the imposter you're not faking what you're doing you are doing it but also if the uh, imposter syndrome hits very hard keep in mind that what you don't cover someone else will do it using what you are producing by example or by a starting point so you are also giving to to academia something important you are giving like a foundation to someone else um what helps me with imposter syndrome is chatting with my peers and with my supervisors um whenever i try to use those tricks that i just mentioned and they don't work i go to my supervisors and explain i'm i'm doing this i'm 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 going to explain to you my work i'm doing this i'm working on this aspect but i keep i keep this idea of there's something off there's something wrong something that i just i'm not i'm not okay with they can uh double check what you're doing if if something that you are very um kind of sure about or they can actually give you this talk about you about re, kind of reviewing a little bit of the in the general consensus of what you are doing like you are doing okay you are doing xyz we are okay if if you are very overcome by the imposter syndrome what uh, helped me was to explain it to my my supervisors and say in the general kind of um um plan of of my phd do you think i'm i'm doing it right uh, is something else that i'm missing i am going to the right pace regarding the general kind of plan that we have and the remaining time that we have so you double check with someone uh you trust your um academic um development to check that everything's all right and maybe they can actually give you resources to um calm yourself down or double check what uh, you are supposed to be doing apart from researching in case you want to do something else to be more reassured or uh, in order to kind of um accomplish that that goal that your your program thinks or your program states that the student needs to do so it's okay to go to your supervisor and say i'm having this issue can we can we chat can we discuss how i'm doing and and why i'm feeling this way so they can actually sit down with you and and reassure you or find um different resources that allow you to don't feel that that way so so highly or so often talking about chatting with peers is very important because you have to keep in mind that you are not alone in academia is more is very very common to feel like you you don't know what you're doing or that you feel like an imposter uh, at least in in the uh, field that I'm moving it's okay to sit down with your peers and say i'm feeling this way do you feel it 
do you feel it as well? I'm doing this, but I don't feel it's okay. What do you think? Normally, chatting with peers will actually set you down in this. We are not we are not alone. I'm feeling this too. Or maybe one of your peers can actually give you tricks to to um, encourage or encourage you to don't feel like that. Or or for example, I had I felt like a, a little bit of an imposter when I was actually developing my research and I found myself having to do interviews and I was scared about all the materials that I have to deal with, all these kind of interview um, recordings, everything. And I sat down with a few peers in a very um, um, similar um, workshop such as this one. And one of them said, you could use this program to help you kind of organize all that. And that's what I did. And it actually allowed me to feel better about my work and it allowed me to do it more efficiently. Because now I wasn't alone with all these piles and piles and piles of actually interview papers because the computer was actually separating them from for for me, organizing in themes that I wanted to tackle, and it was a way of being more more active. Um, so if you feel like that, the best thing you can do is actually sit down, chat with your with your peers and chat with your supervisors and also your friends, because sometimes you don't have to. Maybe you don't have a lot of peers in, in your field or it's a very solitary um, topic that you're talking about. Sometimes stepping back and chatting with your friends. Maybe they are part of the academia, maybe they are not. They can actually tell you, no, I think you're OK, or I normally use this when I have to do a different job that um, maybe it's not yours, but it can be useful in your case because maybe it's about managing, uh, I don't know, uh, different files or different uh, activities. They can actually give you these kind of outside the academia resources that you don't think about in the first place. OK, we are going to uh, talk about sleeping. Um, I don't know if your um, institutions actually give you a lot of information about sleeping and sleeping techniques and sleeping hygiene. Um, I didn't know a lot about the sleeping uh, hygiene before. Uh, having this seminar very similar to this one, but participating as a as a attend attendee in, the, in that case. Um, sleeping is very important to your body because um, it regulates the hormones and other other uh, components that affect your um, mood and your brain and how you can actually um, go on on the following day. So it's very important uh, to have this routine that allows you to go to sleep. Um, in a in a kind of more sustained, restful way. Um, I'm going to chat a little bit about sleeping and sleeping techniques, but I want you to keep in mind that not all the things that I'm going to be commenting are helpful to everyone. This is not a set of elements that if you follow them, everyone will sleep nine hours, eight, nine hours. It depends on the person and it depends on what is keeping you up at night. So first of all, I want you to please, if at some point what I'm going to give you now as a tricks that I try to follow, um, don't work on you. Uh, look for help, professional help if you need it, because sometimes when you're not able to sleep all right and you try to do what we are going to comment now, um, the problem is somewhere else, there's something else there. Um, okay. 
if we are going to talk about uh, sleeping, um, it's very important to it's very important to think about uh, the things that we uh, do that prevent us from sleeping well. So what I normally do first of all is look for natural light. Natural light is the signal that our our body has to to know when the day is ending. But if you are exposed to more natural light, it will regulate all these uh, elements in your body that um, make you feel um, tired at the end of the day. And I'm going to be discussing things that you have probably heard before. In terms of time screen and, and using different electronic devices, uh, it's very common to say that you have to um, reduce your time screen that you don't have you don't have to be exposing your your sight to screen uh, two, hour, two hours, I think, or three hours before uh, going to sleep. It's OK or you don't you don't have to. You don't have to uh, drink caffeine or any kind of uh, other drinking uh, kind of tea things with uh, the element that makes you feel awake. Um, but sometimes uh, the what I want to say about this is that even though screens are normally uh, elements of our daily life routine, which um, keep us active, which is true, sometimes people use the screens as a resting activity. I'm thinking about watching a TV show before going to bed. That can be part of your self care routine. This is not to say that because I told you not to watch uh, or not to to be in front of the TV before two, two hours before going to sleep. Uh, that's that's not to say that you have to cross that out of your uh, sleeping. Oh, sorry about your self care routine. Um, that's that's to say that you need to be aware of, of uh, what is making you up because maybe watching a tv show is not is not um kind of activating your brain it's a way of actually reducing your your brain um kind of action what you what i would suggest is to um create this kind of relaxed routine part of your self care routine in which you know what you your what your brain needs you know what you need to sit down and relax it can be taking some herbal non non uh, kind of non activation um, infusions maybe go and and watch your comfort tv show something that allows you to to relax uh, but also, I would suggest that something I also do, writing down what worries you. Again, we're going to use the writing down um, technique as a way of taking that out. However, it's important to try, try because it's not always uh, possible to have a, a timetable. Let's say I'm going to go to bed at 10 p.m. I know sometimes it's not possible because maybe you arrive late from from another meeting. It can be a social meeting, so you know that you know that maybe you're not ten sharp in in bed already. So what I would do is like try to do a normal kind of a sleeping timetable, and if you cannot follow all the time, try to sleep a little bit more, kind of. 30 minutes more, 15 minutes more, allow you to rest because in the end, you are going to be more active in the morning if you allow you that. Um, about 
about sleeping uh, techniques. Uh, the last thing I need you to, or the, the, the last trick I want you to have is that, I don't know if you do it, I used to do it a long time ago, I don't do it anymore. Try not to work on your, like lying on your bed, mainly because that will give your brain the idea that because you are lying on your bed when you are sleeping you are also working so um it will it will connect the idea of going to bed to continue working because it's where you work try to find somewhere else to to work in your kind of home like leave the the room for for not the room leave the bed because as you can see I am not in a proper studio. I'm using my my room as a as a studio, but leave the bed for sleeping only. In the sense that you, your brain has to identify the bed as somewhere to to um, kind of um, wind down to be able to focus on relaxing and going to to bed. Um, lastly, if Okay, the last point I'm going to be focusing on in this presentation is um, the importance of socializing. This for me is the most important element with the anxiety and self-care um, um, tricks and advices that I gave you is the most important one mainly because it's the thing that I struggle to do the most. Um, as I told you before, it's very important to, to see your colleagues and, and peers, but it's important not only because they will provide you with kind of a space to chat and a space to give you more ideas for whatever uh, work you are developing, but it's important to meet friends, family, peers, because uh, academia can be very isolating at times, uh, especially when you have to do your final um, papers or your final dissertation or your final thesis, because you will have to spend a long time alone working, writing, revising. It's important to, to uh, keep that uh, element of socializing open even in those times because your brain will be willing to connect with someone willing to chat with someone else not only not only about work but about other stuff and also because while you are socializing while you're connected with with someone else your brain is actually being rewarded with psychologically with this idea of I am connecting with people I am I am part of a larger community and it's it's very uh, sometimes academia can be very uh, specific and very isolating because you will dedicate a lot of time to very specific topics and uh, because you have a lot on, on your plate, your brain will tell you, no, 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 we cannot go out to meet your family. We can do it next week when we have less time. Maybe sometimes it's best to uh, like save a couple of hours to say, no, I'm going to meet my family. We're going for a walk. We're going to catch up or, or I'm going to be with my best friend having a meal because I haven't seen her in two months. Uh, through that connection, your um, your head space will change and also you will have the opportunity to chat with your with your um, people, with the people you you are more, most close to about your job, if that's if, about your topic, if that's something you want to do or about their their kind of daily life routine, the issues that they're having, because uh, why, while you're doing that, while you're listening to them talking about daily life stuff, issues that they are having, you are helping them 
and your brain is feeling better or feeling more lifted because you are helping someone else, you are connecting with that someone, that person. In in the same sense, when you go out and you're you're change your environment, you are activating your your brain and and your body to more kind of less heavy related stuff. You are telling them, okay, we, we did the thing for the day. Now we're going out, we we can relax, we we are going to explore a different area of ourselves because we have to take into account that we are more than our studies. Studies are important and academia is important because it's the field you decided to pursue. But you are not only your master's or your PhD or the class you are teaching. You are a complex person with different hobbies and different uh, areas of their life, the uh, life of um, that you want to cultivate. And through socializing, you cultivate that, or at least certain aspects of that, that the academia sometimes doesn't give you the opportunity to do so. And in case you are feeling like because you have been working very hard um, and you have been very focused on a very specific topic and that you don't have the energy or you are not a hundred percent in in the social gathering that you have gone to it can be a meal it can be a concert it can be a walk it is okay to notify to yourself like okay i'm at a concert but i'm not enjoying it myself a hundred percent socializing is, is a quality that we um harvest so it's okay to when you are working alone very very often um it's okay to feel like you lose a little bit of your skills socializing skills you are not losing them you just need to get or you just need to allow time and and more space to your brain to say like okay we are not we are not on researcher part we are not developing we are not developing sorry please excuse me could you switch on the Daniela Angel e Ivan. Sorry, como se diz assim, o Flamengo. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I prefer to um, continue on. As I was saying, let's go to the last slide. Sorry. Um, um, socializing as I was saying, is a process that you will regain. So it's okay to feel like you are not 100% on the activity you are doing. You are there and you are away from work and you are enjoying yourself with your friends and family. It is okay to feel a little bit like I should be enjoying, I should be dancing, I should be the the kind of chatting a lot maybe you don't want to chat in that time you prefer to listen and to engage with that person you met through through listening and and um asking questions about that timing that you haven't seen uh, that person for a really long time and if you are scared about losing your uh, socializing skills even from what I have uh, already mentioned that it's okay to be a little bit not not hundred percent all the time. Um, one activity that I have done when I felt like I was not very social and I was scared that I was very into my work so much that I didn't have kind of this part of me back with me again. What I did was to sit down with uh, different people from my environment and try to pitch my work to them. For example, in my case was trying to explain my uh, topic of my PhD 
to my niece who is a teenager. So you will have to, or at least what I did was to adapt what I what I know about my my topic to her kind of knowledge about it and her own vocabulary in the sense that you are trying to see if you are able to socialize and to connect with someone about uh, your topic in a, in a more in a in a more un informal way that's something that allow me to say like okay i might i might be not very giggly not very social not very talkative but i'm able to connect with someone and i'm not like i'm not up here i'm not away from the kind of real real world but it's it's okay for you to to try that if you feel like you have spent so much time in your area of study that you don't feel like you're connecting with your people um again um, before finishing my presentation and and um, I'm hoping that for the rest of the session, we can actually discuss how are you feeling or the questions that you may have. Um, what I what I uh, want to uh, pinpoint before um, going to this discussion part is that if you feel like even though you are using all the tools that I just mentioned, and you feel like your head is not in the right place, and you feel like your you feel like your uh, you are not like yourself today, or today or the following months. It's okay to look for uh, help. I would suggest to look for help in your institutions first. And um, for example, in the UCM, we have a psychological uh, service for students of different kind of areas. Uh, but if this is not, uh, um, I'm talking about the, the, the UCM because it's my area but, or my, my institution, sorry. But if it's not, uh, if you are from other institution, look for your um, look for the similar um, institutions in your uh, in your university sorry look for the different um, offices in your university and chat with them and if you don't have them look for um, meetings with peers look for suggesting the creation of these spaces of psychological reflection and psychological um, services that you may need because your mental health is the most important aspect of your studies. You need to be able to you need to be able to sit down and and uh, actually um, discuss the what you are feeling uh, to be able to do a proper job. Thank you. I don't know if some of you want to. Thank you. I don't know if some of you want to chat about. About uh, some of your issues or some of the problems that you have mm, that you may have found in your studies. Thank you. I'm glad that is useful. Please, you are allowed to to chat with with us 
if you I'm going I'm going to be here for a bit if any of you have any things that you want to discuss. Okay, um, Rita, I just saw your your question. Thank you. Um, uh, Rita stated that. Um, oops, sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, I hope you are still with me though. Rita stated that eating influenced my moods, level of energy, and sleep. And that's a very common thing. Actually, during the research for this, this um, during my research for this seminar, I have found that a lot of members in the academia have issues with food and food eating and sorry, binge eating and and things like that. I will uh, suggest that you try to keep. Uh, I am not a dietitian, first of all, but I would suggest that you actually have more balanced diet in the sense of trying to keep all the vitamins and, and a lot of vegetables in your diet. Um, it is okay to to add a bit of sugar when when you need, for example, you need to to and if you feel a little bit tired, it's okay to use, for example, one one piece of chocolate as a as a booster of your energy. And also, it will allow you to concentrate on your senses when you're having that kind of sugary uh, treat. Uh, but it's important to keep an eye on how how you eat and try to make it as balanced as possible. Um, I hope I can. I have uh, responded to your your question, Rita. However, if any of you have um, issues or find that you have any issues with food, it is best to talk with a professional in that area, just in case you need a supplement or any kind of directions on your your um, diet. Um, Okay, talking about uh, imposter syndrome. Um, uh, the imp imposter syndrome, uh, it's um, very common in, in academia and also in areas of academia where you are, uh, you are asked to, to do more new content. And uh, what I would suggest is to, uh, as I stated in my, my talk, First, uh, talk with your supervisors or the people who are um, a lot or are part of your um, study um, kind of um, um, journey. Talk to them, explaining how you are feeling, and talk to them in a sense that they may give you, they may reassure you, they may tell you how how you are um, 
they may tell you how you are uh, doing in, in regards of the general kind of plan that you need to, to be doing. Um, in the sense of, for example, in a PhD, you know that you have to do several activities apart from researching that are compulsory. Uh, you do know that by the first year you have to have like a planning and certain elements of your PhD more or less research. Keep with them and tell them, OK, I'm having imposter syndrome because of this area, because I'm not sure if I did this correctly, if I am not sure if I'm going in the right direction and they will um, objectively, objectively will tell you like, OK, I'm, I'm feeling this way. Oh, and your feelings about this is is valid, but you are you are doing well. We we cover all these things in case you miss something because normally in academia you have to do so many things that you feel like you are missing something else. So my uh, um, my first advice is that one, and also um, my second advice is to check with your peers. If you are feeling like an imposter, uh, um, you are not alone. It's something that happens to everyone in, in the academia. And if you are having problem with certain aspects of your research, you may uh, talk with your peers about it and they may give you resources or ideas to, to, to solve that element of your dissertation that makes you doubt. So maybe the imposter syndrome is not completely gone, but it could be more um, um, kind of more east. I hope I have actually give you the the answer that you were looking for, but that's that's something that happens or I, or I find that is useful to me. glad um well if that's okay with all of you i have checked that we have over gone over the time sorry about that um um i think if you don't have any more questions uh we can leave it here if at some point any of you can uh, or want more um help in regarding to to mental health um I will try to complete the uh, to send you the complete um, presentation to your professors and or the professors that are involved in, in the creation of this workshop so they can send it to you and you will have it, I hope. And I hope this session was was useful to, to all of you. So that's right for me. Thank you, Clara. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for keeping up with the presentation. And um, I'm sorry, I just went over the time limit that I stated. Have a good day. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.